Association and the Washburn Area Historical Society. Please plan to return next Tuesday. Oh, and thank you to the Apostle Islands, got to get the thanks out of the way, the Apostle Islands Historic Preservation Conservancy who funds this summer series. Please plan to return next Wednesday, Tuesday. On July 31st, when Warren Nelson will talk about his 23 years on stage at Chicago. That should be a really good show. But several in for now. There will be a 10 minute intermission later when you can feel free to move around, get a drink and refreshments, and fill out that blue survey in the middle of the table. And tonight we welcome Irene Blakely to the podium. Irene is as close to being a local as you can get without being born and going to school here. She spent summer vacations with her grandmother in Washburn and moved here with her husband and son Josh in 1978. And she's a Holman, don't you know? Which makes her Norwegian, not Finnish. Nonetheless, she agreed to research the story of the Finn settlement for tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Ivy Blake. <laughs> when 
most places became industrialized in Europe and America, including Finland. They mainly industrialized in the areas of textiles, forestry, and metalwork. But that autonomy came to an end in 1900 when the Russians started their oppression called Russification. They restricted speech, press, and assembly, and only 6% of the urban Finns could vote anyway, and only 4% of the rural population could vote. So suffrage was not, was very much restricted. The aristocracy had a very rigid social class system, so there was no opportunity for move it, moving among classes. So there was um, little hope of being able to prosper and progress. There were only 11,000 skilled workers left. Um, there, excuse me, there, there were only 11, there were 11,000 skilled workers in Finland who left in um, between 1901 and 1915, which was a major part of the workforce. The, um, the historical general strike of 1906 forced the Tsar to cede certain concessions, including universal suffrage to the Finnish people. And that made Finland the first European country to grant women suffrage through that act. And they were the first to have an independent parliament. They declared their independence in 1917 during the Russian Revolution, which, uh, to be very brief about it, was a civil war between the bourgeois conservatives and the um, social democratic working classes of Russia who overturned the Tsar and created what we then knew as the Soviet Union. In 1919, then, the Finland was self-governed had its own constitution and bill of rights. Well, the economy in Finland, though, was very distressed between 1892 and 1915. There were only 11,000 landowners in Finland at all, and those who owned land owned small, small holdings, maybe one to three acres. 63% or 63,000 of their grown offspring left because they could not continue to work on the farm. And that was because of primogeniture. <coughs> if we remember high school history, we might remember this. And that means that the oldest son got the farm. And anyone thereafter had nothing. They did this to protect the <coughs> small land settings because if you have nine children and you have three acres of land, pretty soon you're farming a plot no bigger than that table. <laughs> that drove people to seek new opportunities in the new world. Add to that a short growing season, very poor soil, very high taxes, and a lot of debt. And you have a situation where a lot of the people needed to leave. And they were mainly from the north, from the region that you see there called Vasa and Ulu. Ulu is a familiar name for that reason. Another problem was that the landowners um, had tenants that they leased the land to, and they ended their, their lease agreements to them at a moment's notice. They could do this because the Finns trusted the handshake as the agreement for um, for the, the lease, and that held no water for those landowners who just decided to terminate the lease if they felt like it. And if you wanted to renew your lease, you had a high fee to pay as well. So 43% of the Finnish population was landless. They were day workers or tenant farmers. The day workers were paid very low wages, or sometimes they were paid in very poor quality goods, like used clothing and shoes. 69% of these people left Finland between those years. 
The northern economy changed when the pitch tar and shipbuilding industries declined in Vasa and Ulu. Grain farming changed to logging and dairy farming. The farmland gave way to sawmills and lumber. Dairy meant that instead of growing other grains, farmers had to grow grass to, to feed their, their animals. But it also made butter available for export. Meanwhile, at the same time, agricultural machinery and techniques meant that fewer people were needed for work. Grain crops require a lot of labor, especially at threshing time, so that further eroded employment. So land values rose, putting ownership out of reach. And populations in the north grew despite famines and other setbacks. And young adults were looking for work. A lot of the servants were women, and factory workers left because of the wages and lack of protection and unemployment. In, in 1892, three-fourths of the workforce in Helsinki was unemployed. Another thing that happened was military conscription. Not only did the Russians um, enforce military conscription for the Finns, uh, who were a grand duchy, um, but they also insisted that the Finnish troops, who were serving their own country, kind of a national guard, uh, were required to serve outside of their country. So half of the Finns did not respond to the call for military service, and America actually sent tickets to get folks out of, of Finland who were threatened by military conscription. Add to that a famine, six years of famine in the 1860s, where there was a 6% population decline in three years, um, and a renewed famine in, in 1892, and you have the makings of a mass exodus. Well, there were Finns arriving very early along the Delaware River as early as 1638, and they even stayed after the Dutch left. They easily assimilated, and very little remains of their cultural um, heritage. John Morton, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, was reputed to be a descendant of those early arrivers. So there were immigration waves that occurred between 1864 and 1924. Um, most were farmers and unskilled laborers, very few professionals. Of those, of the 300,000 immigrants, 35,000 were Swede Finns and 15,000 were Sami. They often settled in the prairies of south central Minnesota. The next year, 30 miners came to Hancock and there were 21,000 there by the time of 1887. So it was a very quick migration. Another group of Lestadian um, Lutherans from northern Finland also immigrated because of religious freedom. It was, it was this religious sect founded by large Lestadius, and they landed here in Michigan, western Minnesota, the Dakotas, and Oregon and Washington. Well, as long as the immigration out of Finland was rural, the ruling classes were very <coughs> indifferent to it. But they feared a mass exodus when the central and southern parts of Finland started to show signs of migration as well, because that deprived them of a, an urban workforce, and it meant that those who remained were very indifferent about their jobs. So they began to talk about migration as a sin. They, they began to accuse those who, of, who wanted to migrate of abandoning their families, and they appealed to their national pride, and. They even started to have some little too, too little too late reforms and wage hikes, not enough to convince anyone. Well, one in nine of the immigrants did return to Finland, but as um, those who wanted them to stay in Finland were quick to point out, they played cards, they gambled, they had loose values, all because of their American experience. <laughs> you should not go to America. <laughs> So most of this migration after 1892 were young people, almost half of them were women. Um, 
and they first went to the cities internally within Finland, but quickly found that they were among the unemployed in the cities and they needed to, they needed to find another option. So between 1893 and 1915, they started to get their $20 tickets money together to come to America. Um, and especially Central and South Finland where this tenancy system was the most extensive. 85% were peasants, rural agricultural experience, and 15% only from the cities. The 20th century migration was in three waves. That first one before the general strike of 1906 were, were influenced mostly by social democracy ideals. They were accepted in America as very hard workers, but they were also known to be clannish. They had a unique language that was hard to learn, and they spoke Finnish together and stayed together and had a hard time learning English. So many of them worked on Finn-only work crews in whatever industry they worked in. And they were very much sought after. There were ads asking for Finnish workers. Groups of them, whole groups of them, uh, were wanted by employers. After the general strike be and before World War I, the immigrants were influenced more by the direct force to resolve problems. They really wanted to be social actors. They were considered troublemakers, in fact, for organizing about fair wages. And they were blacklisted, some even threatened with deportation. And they were considered, for that reason, un-American. Then the third wave from the First World War to the Immigration Restriction Act in the 1920s, the immigrants were radicalized by the Civil War by the civil war in Russia, and, the influ and they were influenced by the progress of socialism. Then after World War II, most Im more immigrants were nationalistic and more conservative. So that is where they came from, and then they came to Wisconsin. So here's a population of, the, of Wisconsin. The migration here was the heaviest between 1890 and 1910. It was a quest for security, <clears throat> trying to get away from the vicissitudes of this urban industry and the itinerant light lumberjack life that they had had to take up when they came to America. They mostly then became farmers in Wisconsin. They were a late addition to the mass migrations from Europe and they weren't in Wisconsin until the 1880s. They tended to, sweet fins tended to settle in the east, the Midwest, and the west. The Sami tended to stay in the Midwest and the west. And they still exist in Michigan. 75% of Wakefield is currently Finnish. One, uh, 1% of, 1.2% of Michigan's population. Uh, Minnesota, California, Washington, and Massachusetts um, follow. Half of them <clears throat> live in the Midwest, and a fourth of them live in Wisconsin, of all the Finnish immigrants who came. They're drawn to Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin, in part because it resembles Finland. The land, the geography, looks very much like the land of Finnish. It looked, Finland, it looked like home to them. And when they abandoned the mines in Minnesota and Michigan, um, they came to places like Marengo and Minersville, Highbridge, and North York. So there were job opportunities in the Midwest, but they were for mining, industrial, and port work. But these kind of workers were small in number who were among the immigrants because only 1,300 of the 4,700 were urban. They arrive in Iron County in 1887, and by 1907, there were 200 miners there. Eventually, they drifted to Ulo and Marengo areas when they gave up on mining. 
twenty who lived in Hurley in the eighteen eighties. It was said, Cumberland. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, the Capones and other other uh, folks moved into that area, they um, certainly didn't help. Hurley was one of the seven sin cities of the U.S. <laughs> but things have phases, and in 1906, four mine shafts were operating in Iron Belt, Michigan. And, or no, Iron Belt, yeah, Michigan, with armies of workers. But by 1933, in the depths of the Depression, Iron Belt was pretty much a ghost town. Douglas County offered shipyards, coal, and iron ore dock workers and the railroad kinds of jobs. So Finn settled in South Superior and especially in Alouise. Alouise is that long stretch going into Superior. Jobs were seasonal though in these, in these areas, so the men had to go to the lumber camps in the winter. Ashland County had 200 Finns by 1910. So let's talk about miners and why they, why they would leave mining. The Finnish workers worked in the copper and iron mines in Hurley and Iron Belt. Well, 12 of them died in the Ishpeming mines in an accident in 1887. Of the 29 who died in Marquette County Mines in 1902, 12 were Finns. There were 146 fatal accidents in 17 Houghton County Mines. And then add in miners' consumption, rheumatism, sil silicosis, back injuries that were common ills among the miners. And there was a lot of motivation to leave. The Finns participated in working class movements and strikes and they held out to the end. But even if the strike failed, their reputation as troublemakers were then cemented, and that caused them to be blacklisted and unable to be miners any longer. Then, mostly in the winter, and some year round, became lumberjacks. It was happier work than the mines, but not really that happy. The Heinz Camp 14, was reputed to have very wet lands, and the food is bad. <laughs> Bunkhouses had dirt floors, small windows, and a single door for ventilation. The men were cramped inside to tell tales, smoke, and they lived in those smoky cold conditions all winter long. Some stayed on the land after logging left and claimed that land for farming. <laughs> They peeled hemlock bark and sold it to the tanneries at Prentice and Tomahawk. They cut cedar shingles and they were riving and shaving them by hand into shakes. They cut railroad ties with broad axes and loaded them aboard railroad cars. And this is how they did it. They would, a man would tip each 380 pound railroad tie up on one end, grasp it halfway down, and straighten up, and then tilting and balancing the load on one shoulder would take a running start and run up a 16-foot plank into the boxcar with the railroad tie where it was stacked neatly in a row with the others. <laughs> These men were paid three cents per time for loading and often had to work all night long by moonlight in order to finish before the freight cars came in the morning to pick up the boxcar. So this is not satisfactory work. Factory work had typically low rate wages, a lot of strikes, and a high level of unemployment. It was a very unsecure kind of, of work. Many Finns worked in Milwaukee as machinists and general laborers and in the tanneries there. And they became involved in the labor movement and associated themselves with the IWW. Another thing that added to the reputation of being 
um, un-American troublemakers. Well, they could also work at the railroad. They could get $2.25 a day for loading freight cars. They worked in Duluth, South Shore, and Atlantic Line, the Duluth Masabi and Iron Range Road, and the Northern Pacific Railroads. Oh, dock work, that's another option. But that again is seasonal. They worked on Lake Superior. They could be recognized by their colorful tattoos. Well, the finished tattoos had a very cheerful look to them. But that belied the fact that the reason they had them at all was for aiding others in identifying their bodies if they drowned. They loaded ore boats in Marquette, Duluth, Ashland, and Superior. A newspaper calculated that in 1899, a shoveler paid 10 cents, 10 and a half cents per ton had to shovel nearly 50 tons to earn a $5 daily wage. And there were dangerous accidents. The death rate at the docks was two per month. Again, high unemployment due to seasonal nature of the work and new machinery and techniques displaced the workers. Seamen lived dangerous lives, as we all know, fighting the gales and blizzards on our inland sea. So what they turned to is agriculture. Two-thirds of the Finns settled in rural areas prefer in farming to low-wage factory work. So the land agents, though, were there to, to prod them into moving. They were unscrupulous in their promises about independence and security in what, what they called the land of bread. They wooed people with free tickets and the prospect of cheap and abundant land. And they told people that farming was the way to conserve their Finnish culture. They painted a picture of healthy, robust way of life in Washburn. But according to a Wisconsin historian, Mark Nipping, it was a vision not to be realized. The best clayey soil in the state was difficult to work and produced relatively low yields. The free cabins turned out to be rough board shacks covered with tar paper. The roads, when they existed at all, were mere dirt ruts and became quagmires when it, uh, in wet weather. Because of the lack of usable roads, many families arrived in their new home on the local freight train. The engineer stopped the train as close as possible. The family climbed down, shouldering all their possessions, and walked off in a mile or more through the forest to find their stump land farm. They cut the second growth trees and chopped brush, piling it into heaps for wintertime burning. They blasted stumps out of the ground or pulled them out with chains and horses chopping through the roots as massive tree stumps rolled over on their sides. Children grubbed the heavy clay off of the roots, after which the stumps were burned or piled along the edges of fields to form fences. Field stones were also picked off the cropland to build dry walls and fences. It was possible to clear only two or three acres of land per year by hand. The fence were th this this slide is showing you um, a bank that is, is offering another promise of land and money for Finns to come. And we'll just give you money and you'll have this wonderful land. Only maybe a few of you in the audience can read that. <laughs> the Finns were slow to, re to acquire land because they were late in arriving in the US and because they had Many of them preferred to make a lot of money that they thought they could make right away in, in America and return to Finland. And also, they had missed the homesteading period when um, people were given land free and many of them chose the best land. There wasn't anything left by the time they had come. Eventually, they, did, they were able to save money <laughs> and buy this cheap, abundant land. But many of them failed as farmers. They had been tenant farmers. They hadn't actually been involved in the business end of farming in Finland. They had been day workers. 
they didn't really know about business practices or the new agricultural practices in the new world. Well, farming in Bayfield County was perhaps a little easier than it was in some other counties in Wisconsin because actually our growing season is 130 to 150 days, probably now with climate change is much more, but it's compared to 110, 120 in other parts of the state. But the clay soil can't be worked until later in the season either, so it's, it's not much of a benefit. And the land fit the dairy profile as well as fruit and veg vegetables. It was not like the uh, making planting grain, which can be done in other in other counties in Wisconsin. And farms were larger up here than other counties, an average of 96 acres. Farms also peaked in 1935, so there were a lot of farms up here in Bayfield County, but then they declined by about one fourth. The Depression era saw this overexpansion of farming, and so the farms were slept, swept into the Depression, although for subsistence farmers, like many of the Finns were, that, was, that didn't touch them quite um, as, as deeply. But mortgages fell due during the Depression. Immigrants were aging and the children were abandoning the farms. They didn't have capital in order to modernize their farms. And um, they, they had failures because of fraudulent land agents and because of mistakes that they made in choosing their land and also by very poor advice that they got um, from, the, um, from the state and federal agricultural agencies. Um, so, World War II reduced the population and agricultural decline became precipitous. And after the Second World War, the United States became the breadbasket for the world. During the Marshall Plan, we had promised that we would feed everyone. So farming, uh, again, became a prosperous, a, a prosperous venture. So Finnish farmers has, have ever since then become the agricultural educators and leaders, realizing that it's not just better land that you need, but better use of the land. This is one of the homes built in a Scandinavian style of log dwelling. Or tupa. It was usually the first structure, small, one-story, single-room log house with shaped roofs and rough lumber floor, floors, preferably white pine. <coughs> and then the structure was added onto uh, by a log or frame section by section as the family grew and prospered, or it was replaced with a new larger home. Furniture was also homemade and simple, a table and benches, a pie safe cover for food store cupboard for food storage, rope or slat beds, a dry sink maybe, and the ubiquitous wood burning cook stove. They had open wall shelves that might contain a treasured clock or a few books, and coats and caps were hung on pegs stripped. Um, driven into holes bored in the solid log walls. They had wooden churns, spinning wheels, baby cradle, among the first signs of domestic life, and a two-harness rug loom that would soon follow. In Finland, the homes had often 12 to 16 outbuildings, small buildings dedicated for a specific purpose. And they were built around in a circle. And this was in order to protect the home from the dangers of assault and attack. Well, in the US, they didn't have to do that. But they still had many outbuildings. But they were broadened out because there was land available for them, because they have been able to clear away some stumpage that would be large enough to put a building on. Because they had grown, evolved, the farm had evolved to have a need for some kind of storage of animals or feed. And 
and a farmer could do it by himself, managed to build a small building in spare time, and there was no danger of attack in Wisconsin. And immediately after the house was built, and sometimes before, the sauna was built. It was perhaps a nine square foot or even a 12 square foot building near a stream or a lake. The early ones were smoke saunas. All fins were considered hardened, patient. They were thought to have passive strength, resignation, perseverance, a contemplative way of thinking. And they were slow to anger, cool in peril, cautious, taciturn, living for the day, adhering to the old, known to be dutiful, law-abiding, hospitable, honest, but reserved, a true friend, slow to thaw, but having a love of tales, songs, and a disposition to satire. The Finns built their own institutions in Wisconsin, including the Finn settlement, and we can talk about that a bit when we return. writer who watched the Finns leave from Hanko, which was the jumping off place in Finland for those who were going to emigrate, said, not tar, not pitch, not Kalhava knives, nor birch bark knapsacks, nor birch bark shoes were Finland's gift to America, but people. And the people brought with them their culture and their institutions. And they have been a more lasting feature in our country and in Wisconsin and in our community here than their architecture. They built their own institutions, churches, benefit societies, cooperatives, libraries, music and drama groups, study groups, and gymnastics groups. The Temperance Society, which we associate with the Prohibition era and the, um, the activities to keep people from drinking rock god booze were launched by the Finns, but what they did is use the Temperance Society to provide illness and funeral benefits, to sponsor dramatic and choral groups, bands, and debating clubs. They established libraries and reading rooms. They catered to the recreational needs of the community through folk games and dancing and athletic clubs and festivals. The Finn Fest is a lasting institution that continues this tradition. The workers' associations began as well here, and they were initially idealistic and non-revolutionary and non-political. But the Finnish Socialist Federation in Hibi transformed them into socialist locals around 1906. These institutions assimilated then into the larger society. For example, the, the socialist societies joined the American Socialist Party. One important thing that the Finns did is publish newspapers. They believed in self-education, and their newspapers kept them connected to Finland and were written in the Finnish language. They had political papers and some popular humor sheets with a socialist bias. They had a feminist paper and a farm journal. One notable newspaper is still published in Superior called Taiomis. Uh, say never. <laughs> of course, I had, I had no chance there. It's a working class and communist leaning publication. But no fear, because the Finns know how to do this. The consumers' cooperative movement is a lasting monument to the Finnish culture. A cooperative, of course, is a business that vol is voluntarily owned and controlled by its members, and goods are purchased together using the power of scale and bulk, bulk um, buying. 
and then it's the goods are distributed among the community members on a nonprofit or cost basis. So they pool their buying power, and then and and uh, have established co-ops all over Wisconsin. There's still a co-op in Iron River and in Hancock. The leadership, it's the leadership of the Finns that drove the cooperative movement in Wisconsin and the development of this institution. The churches are other institutions that they participated in. The Finnish Apostolic Lutheran Church is part of that Lestadian movement that I mentioned earlier. The Finnish National Lutheran Church was organized in America in Wyoming in 1898. And then there's the Suomi Synod. Suomi, of course, is the Finnish word for Finland. And that's the only one I might have pronounced properly. <laughs> and it's a transplant from the Finnish State Church. And it was founded in, in our area, in Calumet, Michigan, in 1890. <clears throat> the Finns used the churches as places of learning. And they used it to teach the, the congregation's citizenship and history and to connect also with their Finnish culture and maintain those ties. They had other institutions that were new in the New World, like the Knights of Kalava, which began in 1898 and it was based on the Kalevala, an ancient Finnish epic. And its purpose was to educate Americans about Finnish culture. Sunday schools and camps taught the children Finnish culture, politics, and religion, and they taught it in the Finnish language. So children spoke fin Finnish. First generation children always, almost always spoke Finnish as well as English. In other ways, the Finns quickly assimilated American ideas, clothing styles, for example, and foods, and a preference for clapboard signing. <laughs> education has always been very important, formal education as well as community-centered education. The early immigrants, no matter what their situation coming over, and we've talked about how um, desperate their lives had been, were literate. Publishing was important to them, and self-education a central tenant. So, that is what uh, prompted them to develop seminars and debates, clubs, and have plays and musical concerts. So despite hardships that they experienced here, many achieved high school diplomas and college degrees. They built two colleges, the Workers' People College in Minnesota, which teaches trades and politics that duplicates the folk school tradition, and then Suomi, which is now known as Finlandia College in Hancock, Michigan. It was begun in 1895 in the Lyceum tradition. Became a two-year college in 1923, and in 1994 it became a four-year college, and it exists today. So now we get to the Finn settlement, and a good bit of what I'll say about this has been from research into Christina Nemisto's, Nemisto? Nemisto's um, uh, articles uh, and memoir of her life in, at the Finn Settlement. So I owe a great deal to her and I'm going to be quoting uh, liberally from her memoir. There were in Minnesota a group of unemployed Finnish miners in a place called Sparta, Minnesota. They came to Santa Cunda. Santa Cunda, and I'm probably saying that wrong too, means the colony of the 100. The idea was to create a settlement of 100 families. This group came and others followed, settling to the south and some to the north of the Sioux River and some a few miles to the west of Washburn, and a few in the county seat itself. And this is the current seat. By 1914, there were 40 or 50 Finnish families in the region. So why did they come? Well, the American Bank Trust Company said, 
Go, every man, to Satakunda, where the soil is clayey. The land is easily cleared for agriculture. The winter is short. The snow is light. And frosts unknown. Well, pants on fire. So in 1903, land agents showed pastoral pictures of Washburn with abundant fish and churches already established. For others, the reason for coming was the instinct for self-preservation, longing for freedom, the sting of the whistling whips that drove them here to struggle with the barren and stump-covered land. But the dream of rural freedom was only partially fulfilled. As we know, the Santa Kunta Finns rediscovered whistles and bosses at the Washburn coal docks, the Bayfield quarries, and the Barksdale munitions plant, where they sought part-time jobs. Three miners started this. John Nemisto, Matty Bakala, and Matty Heikala settled here. Later, the Matt Matsons moved into the neighborhood, and after 1906, many more families came, including Charles Lampola, Jack Marilla, and Gus Lato. Through 1915, other families moved in. Carl Kainu, Matt Kainu, Victor Marilla, Jonas Lato, Andrew Jacobson, Matt Mackey, John Kosky, Fred Kosky, and August Niska. Christina Nemisto recounts her journey from her village of Kokola to Hakonimi, where she boarded the ship to England, then on to Halifax. She said that, the song of Finland rang out bright and clear until Finland was out of sight. On board, she sailed with her sister, Lisi, and on board she was approached by a man with less than noble intentions. And she, using her few words in English, ordered him to get out. And then she decked him, <laughs> literally. She hit him and he fell on his back on, on the deck of the boat. She didn't see him again. <laughs> she and her sister then took the train when they arrived from Hall in Halifax through the Canadian wilderness and eventually to Montreal after surviving a deadly derailment. They walked miles after that to, until a freight train picked them up and then they arrived in Ironwood in 1896. They sought work, but they were among the many unemployed young women in the area. Christina was able to get a maid of all work job for only a month and a half, but there she met John in 1897, and they were married and moved to Colorado where his brother lived. Their first child was born, but she became desperately ill and the child became fevered as well. And during this time, with all this hardship, she learned of her brother's death in a Schofield mining accident. To her, religious beliefs were paramount. She said, I decided that as soon as my husband returns to town, I would suggest to him that we move away from here. There wasn't even a minister to whom I could turn in my sorrow. Soon afterwards, we decided to move and had planned on going to Sparta, Minnesota. So, I'm just going to read most of this from her memoir because it tells about the home in Washburn. She, and she is a wonderful writer. Our heavenly home was now clear to us, but we didn't have a home here on earth. One evening my husband went to visit a neighbor. Returning from there, he said that tomorrow he would go with Maddie Pakala and Maddie Heikala to Washburn to look for some land. He even brought some pictures to show me. There were beautiful deer, large trout, and fat suckers. You could have all these without a permit, he explained. Right on Lake Superior is a nice town where there are several churches. They've decided to go look at this paradise. And they're right. <laughs> As decided the night before, my husband left with our neighbor to Washburn. The country looked promising, so each of us bought 40 acres. 
must have looked good to them because when they returned, they brought news that within a week we were leaving to make our home. Our belongings were to be brought there, so the men ordered a box car into which were loaded the modest belongings of the three families. We had one cow, too, and the only way to get her there was to load it on with the furniture in the same box car. <laughs> Since somebody had to keep an eye on our goods and take care of the cow, Maddie Heikala was selected to, for the job. On April 21st, 1904, we left for Washburn which is the year that also Washburn was incorporated as a city. With sad hearts, we had to leave our dear relatives and good friends and start out to our new home, which didn't even exist yet. The following night, we spent in Duluth from where we went to Washburn the next morning. There we found lodging in a land company house. The house had a second floor, which was one large room, to which led a creaky and wobbly staircase from outside. The three families lived in this single room for some time. Each family had several small children who seemed to enjoy running up and down the shaky stairs. It was getting on my nerves, so I told my husband to go up and make the house of sod, if nothing else, for it is impossible to keep an eye on the children all the time so they wouldn't fall down the stairs. There were no building supplies to begin with, so my husband bought a thousand feet of run, rough lumber and two rolls of tar paper out of which he made a house. And it didn't take very long either. On June 1st, we moved into it. Traveling there wasn't an easy task as there were no roads. A wagon trail went up a little way, but the rest of the way was just a path through the brush. In the morning, my husband hired a team of horses. Our possessions were loaded on a wagon, the children myself piled on top of the load. We had quite a family by then, four children, of whom the oldest was only five years old. Two of the youngest were not able to walk yet. With the children on my lap, it was so crowded on top of the load that I couldn't move a bit. So we started up the road following the lake shore. The distance seemed long in this strange country and the road being so bad. Finally, we turned away from the lake down a river valley. The water in the river was murmuring as if in welcome for humans to settle in the wilderness to keep it company. At last, we turned away from the river and up a steep hillside. When we got on top, the horses stopped and my husband started unloading the wagon. I thought we had reached our destination, but that wasn't so. The cow had been tied to the wagon with a rope and had followed us, and now my husband started leading it to its new home. I remained on the hill with the children until he would return to get some other stuff. After waiting what seemed to be a long time, I was getting tired, the children were getting hungry, so I opened the sacks in which we had brought food I, it was getting late in the afternoon, and I was getting impatient, thinking something had happened to my husband. Waiting for a while longer, I began to sweat from fear and anxiety. Didn't want to start yelling for him, thinking the children would get scared that we were lost. Finally, I heard something moving in the brush. He came towards us breathless and said, so here you are. This isn't the place where I left you. <laughs> he had been looking for us for hours. We had a mile or more to go on foot and carry all the stuff. The horses had returned to town with their driver as soon as the wagon had been unloaded. From among the possessions, I dug out a baby buggy on which I loaded a coffee pot, sugar, and milk. Our oldest daughter, Jenny, who was five, had to push this precious load. On the back of our four-year-old son, we loaded a sack containing bread. My husband and I took each of the younger children in our arms and as much other stuff as we could carry and started out on the final stretch through the woods to the tar paper shack that was waiting for its new occupants. After walking through a winding path through the woods for some distance, we came to an old railroad. My husband said he would walk ahead faster. A little distance away, he had left our cow, and from there we could see the roof of our home. Although we were getting close to the camp, we were not still in it. For some distance, we had to crawl over and under wind-blown trees 
which is quite a task with our loads, since the cow isn't noted for high jumping. It had, it had to be led around each and every tree that had followed. The shack was full of pieces of lumber and wood, as is usually the case when the carpenters are in the hurry. The doors were not yet in place, and neither was the stove, and I was impatient for a cup of coffee in our new home. It didn't take long before the stove was in place and the coffee pot boiling. I will never forget that cup of coffee as long as I live. <laughs> Eventually, they paid $10 and got a horse that was worth maybe $10, and they were planning to get another cow. They had friends from Minnesota visit them, Mr. and Mrs. Kikuri. Mrs. Kikuri, or Lisi, was aghast at the homestead and cried, but are you really going to stay here? <coughs> Why, of course. We have paid $10 for the land and we have done a lot of work. Here we are like in paradise. Look at all the wildflowers. Life is smiling and blooming wherever you look. In the evening, she found sleeping accommodations for all 12 of them by putting six across each of two beds. <laughs> Farming was a daunting task. Another pioneer family, Matt and Elizabeth Kainu, shared their story. In April of 1914, they set out with their four-year-old son, Wayne, and their three-year-old daughter, Ani, from Minnesota and traveled by train to Washburn. They were moved to their land in the Finn settlement. Mass Journal recounts it. What a shock. Mother almost cried when told, this is your land. It was only cut over land with huge stumps standing all over that had and they had bought it sight unseen. They had left Minnesota where Matt worked in an ore mine. Before that, they had lived in Red Lodge where he worked in a coal mine. He and his brother were trapped in the mine, in fact, by a huge fire. Both of them were able to escape, but many others had died. When the mine closed, they moved to Minnesota. In both these places, they had homes, and now this. How were they going to make a living? How could they farm? Elizabeth was pregnant, and that son, William, was born and died in October of that year. Matt worked in the lumber camps and cleared the land. The first planting was three years after they arrived. They planted one bushel of wheat, three pounds of beans, and 200 strawberry plants. They were on their way to prosperity. Maddie Heikola, uh, back at, at their part of the Finn settlement, had discovered an abandoned camp uh, or homestead with a clearing that was suitable for haying. Two ministers were brought to christen the Heikola child, and they asked Christina about the three small haystacks that she had that they could see, since they thought that the hay could have been in one large stack. Didn't seem economical to them or efficient, but Christina said, my husband works at the quarry by Lake Superior, and during the day, I cut the hay between the trees and brush wherever the scythe will fit. And where the scythe will not fit, I use the sickle. I cannot pile the hay into large stacks by myself. So she was doing it as efficiently as humanly possible. Well, life was hard and getting harder, but the spirit of Sisu, or I think it's a kind of fortitude in Finnish, was strong among these folks. Christina begins, dark clouds began to gather on life's horizon. First, my husband went to look for a horse, but soon came back with news that the horse had broken its leg the only thing to do is shoot it. We consoled ourselves with the fact that the old horse wasn't much anyway, and our hay would surely now last all winter. My husband came back in the evening with a cow about to freshen, and the cow freshened the following day and died. So while 
Nimia Stopakala, Heikala, and Lampala were working, the women decided to make a sauna in the empty barn. After all, there were no animals to put in it anymore. Might as well make good use. We tackled the job by hauling rocks for the fireplace on which water is thrown to get steam. We made benches hauled leaves from the woods for the floor. Before the men came home, we started to heat the sauna using wood that would give a lot of smoke, so the men would notice from a distance that a sauna had appeared in the woods. That evening, we had our first bath in our sauna, which we really enjoyed. The death of the horse, cow, and pig had already been forgotten. Oh, I didn't even tell you about the pig dying. <laughs> when Lampola came from the sauna, he opened the door to our house a little and asked if we would serve sauna coffee. I promised that tonight we would drink two full cups. In May, another child was born to Christina, the woman who had been the midwife to the community and who has had assisted at the births of nearly all the children in the settlement. At one point, a butcher offered a cow in exchange for clearing three acres of land and burning the brush. John accomplished the task, finishing in a snowstorm, but he got the cow. By then, they had also acquired another horse. But more trials awaited these settlers. Pakala, Haikala, Lempala, Lado, and Nemisto went to North Dakota, are you following this? <laughs> went to North Dakota for work. The women gathered at Christina's feeling kind of gloomy about taking leave of their husbands. Storm clouds gathered on that hot, dry August day and they decided to move into the living room from, from the living room at Christina's house to the shack which was attached to the living room. A tornado whirled through and tore the house apart. The Lempolas had lost their home entirely. Christina said, we four families went to Lido's for the night. Nobody slept that night and there wouldn't have been room for any of us to sleep as they had only just one room. In the morning, I went to see Matson to ask if he wouldn't fix the roof over our living room out of pieces of leftover lumber and tar paper. We would have shelter from the sun, even if it wasn't waterproof. I gathered all of our belongings in there. I spent the days with the children at home, but the nights we spent wherever we were invited. But that's not enough adversity. Their house, their horse became injured. It had a terrible large cut on its thigh and the leg was festering all the way down, told the other women to collect their urine each night and bring it down to me. Then I got some choke cherry um, bark and cooked this with the urine. I tied several rags on a stick and with this mixture, I washed the horse's leg several times a day until it was finally cured. <laughs> She wrote to her husband about the destruction of the house and he returned immediately to start building, make logs for a new house. It was getting late in September, she said, and we had to have a house for the winter. It was, already, it was ready in time, though it had just a rough floor and the joists were covered with paper. There we lived until the following autumn. Then we had a hailstorm, which broke all the windows on the south side and the roof leaked so much that the paper from the ceiling came down. Then we put a boarded ceiling up and made a new floor and a new chimney. The work wasn't quite finished by the time we could see the forest fires in the distance. <laughs> forest fires in the nearby forest threatened to burn down the houses of all the pioneers. One day, a German farmer came to tell us to move out or we would all burn. He invited all five families to come to his house and told us to bring our livestock into his pasture. We immediately started carrying our dishes and clothes into a dry well, which we covered carefully and we left for a safer place. The men remained behind to fight the fire. In those days, cries for help rose to heaven from everyone's lips. But at the same time, a thick cloud of smoke also rose towards heaven as the fire licked the dry earth and consumed everything in its path. We were afraid for our husbands' lives, too. We climbed up a high hill to see if our homes were still standing and to see if we could notice any of the men moving around. On the third day, Heikala came to tell us that they were all alive and the houses still remained. 
On the fifth day, we returned to our homes. What a miraculous sight greeted us there. The fire had burned everything right up to the walls, but the houses weren't touched. What seemed even more miraculous was the fact that our haystacks weren't burned. So, with all of this disaster, her comment is, wonderful are the acts of God, a faith beyond reckoning. But in a, in a next chapter of her memoir, she talks about good things in life. So we'll move there. Even though the winter was cold and stormy, Christina said, we didn't have too much to worry, worry about the children as long as we dressed them well for the night and put all five crosswise on the bed and cover them carefully. In 1920, the workers' hall was constructed by the men of the community. The school Christmas programs and other school activities were held there, plus pie socials, basket socials, and many plays in the Finnish as well as English languages, with young and old participating. Wedding dances and other parties took place in the workers' hall. Group activities were conducted for the youth under the leadership of John Kosky, equivalent to the present physical fitness programs bobsledding, skiing, and homemade, on homemade skis, and potato roasts were enjoyed in the winter. Summer festivities included group picnics, fish boil on May Day at Big Rock, and baseball. In the early years, Sunday school was held at the Lampala and Nemisto homes with Mrs. Lampala and Mrs. Nemisto as teachers. Many learned to read and write the Finnish language as a result of these classes. Well, Matt Kainu's journal tells about life in this settlement from his family's point of view. He says, not all was work. There was much visiting. Father was a comic, mother sang, and both were in programs and plays. Father had belonged to an athletic club. In winter, there was skiing, hunting, trapping, and in the summer, picnics at Big Rock. Since water had to be carried to the homes, the women would all often bring their clothes and wash them at the river while the children swam and fished. Historian Nipping notes that they carved their own skis, fashioned snowshoes, and whittled fishnet bobbins, fishing floats, fish line reels, and hook boxes. They also made knives out of old files attaching bone or antler handles to the steel blades. Well, the men spent the winter in the logging camps and left the women to deal with the farm as best they could during the, during the long winter. But at the end of the winter, they began their summer work back at the homestead. Well, the next fall, school was going to start, and many of the families had children who were ready to start school. They didn't know what, how to deal with a dilemma, though. The children did not have clothes for school, and if they didn't, they couldn't attend. Well, education being as important as it was, the women had to find a solution, and they did. Christina says, one day, when Mrs. Heikola came to visit, I suggested that we should go pick blackberries and sell them in town, for there was a market for them. The next day, we went to pick the berries, and we had large pails full of them. The following morning, we went to town, a pail of berries in one hand and a crock of butter in the other. On the way, we had to cross a river where there was no bridge, just a log fallen across it. I had been worried about crossing that river long before we came to it, wondering what would happen, as I never could walk along a single log. Mrs. Heikola and Mrs. Leo went ahead and even carried my berries with them, though I still had the butter. When I got down a little ways, the nearby trees seemed to start moving upstream, and I was getting dizzy. The crock of butter was wrapped up in a cloth, which I held between my teeth and tried crossing the log on all fours. <laughs> I finally made it, though the others were bursting with laughter. And I felt like laughing too, but I couldn't do that while still on the log, as the precious butter would have dropped from my mouth to the bottom of the river. Arriving in town, it didn't take too long to sell our berries at 10 cents a quart. The butter was sold also, and now we started to look for a clothing store since we had some money. In those days, you could buy per kale for five cents a yard and cotton at six cents. 
after buying 24 yards of material with the money from our berries and some food with the money from the butter, we came home. We made several berry selling trips to town and at the end of the season, we had plenty of material of different patterns. When school started, the children had decent clothes. Well, education was highly valued, and I might as well mention the school right now. In the spring of 1908, just four years after the Finn settlement was dedicated, the first school was built and named the Gibson School after its first teacher. She boarded with the Mad Bacalas. She enjoyed entertaining the children on weekends, sometimes popping corn, and at the last stages of that, removing the co cover so the corn would pop out of the pan to the children's delight. Well, my mother was a young teacher at the Finn Settlement in the beginning of the 1930s. She was 20 and fresh out of normal school. She'd had one year of experience teaching in Grandview School. She talked about boarding with families, taking turns among them. Boarding the teacher was a source of pride. She said that families would say, well, you know we have the teacher this month. <laughs> she would share the girl's side of the sleeping loft which had been bisected to accom accommodate boys on one side, girls on the other. In the morning, she said, the older boys would waken early and carry wood to build a fire in the schoolhouse. They would be faithful with attendance until they were needed for the more pressing farm chores in the spring. She was able to organize the older children to help with lessons for the younger ones. But language was a challenge. English was difficult to learn, and school might be the only place where they practiced it. Yet the children were eager to learn, and they adapted well. But they still spoke to each other in Finnish, and were able to make mischief knowing that the teacher couldn't understand them. <laughs> On the weekends, my mother would walk back to Washburn from Friendly Valley Road to help her widowed mother. Sometimes her brother would fetch her in his Model T. The rugged, rutted roads made the trip more like a carnival ride, and washouts and snowdrifts commonly kept him from picking her up in his precious vehicle. Well, now there's more adversity and sorrow to come. In 1920, a one-month-old son became ill and died. Then a 15-year-old daughter became ill with a terrible sickness for a long time and fever. As her condition wor worsened, Christina prayed, and finally, the girl became alert and was hungry. She did survive. But then, their youngest st child started to become restless, and they decided to take him to a doctor. She got the child dressed, and she dressed herself, and she was ready to go into the carriage to go into town when she went to pick up the child, she realized that he was stiff. So instead of going to town, they began to rub and bathe him, but to no avail. He was breathing for a half an hour, and then, as she said, he was taken in Jesus' arms. She said, adversity and sorrow never end in a person's lifetime. Neither do they all come in the same form or on the same day. Sometimes they strike in the middle of the night. I will always remember the night of January 12, 1926. My husband was out at the lumber camps with his horses. About nine that evening, I went to bed with the children. While lying in bed, we read the evening paper from our, our uh, catechisms, which were brought from Finland. I'm, I'm sorry, the evening prayer. I didn't undress as I had to make a trip to the barn later on. Between three and four in the morning, I was wakened by a noise. Still half asleep, I couldn't make out what it was, thinking at first that it might be rain on the roof. But then I noticed an unfamiliar brightness outside. Then my son, who was sleeping upstairs, jumped from bed and yelled, Mother, the house is burning. First, I was so scared that I didn't even answer. Not hearing anything, he came running downstairs to see if we were still alive in case the fire had started from our room. The children were able to save a few household articles. For some unknown reason, I started upstairs. After a few steps, I heard a voice, help me get out of here. 
Our son had gone back upstairs to get his clothes and was suffocating from the smoke. Without help, he probably would have burned there. Everything else was burned, our clothes, food, furniture, and everything that we possessed. We were left standing outside in the wintry night with nothing on but our night clothes. Standing by the burning embers, we were able to keep warm until morning. That isn't a charming story, but the memoirs are. And she concludes them this way. There would be many other things to write about, but most of them would be merely everyday events to most readers. For a great many of them have traveled the same road as I have, namely they have come to America from Finland as in immigrants. We can thank God for all the good he has showered upon us. There can be no life free of sorrows upon this earth, but in recent years we have had less sorrows and heartaches than those in our old homeland. Less than two dozen Spartans, the original founders of the Finn settlement, survive, and only about three or four farm. The Finn Hall and social clubs remain. Finn Fest is a Chautauqua type event that incorporates cultural and educational activities along with entertainment. The past institutions in Washburn were the National Lutheran Finnish Church that operated from 1905 to 1943, and the Socialist Local, which had, in 1912, 12 members. In 1972, a committee formed to create a marker, quote, to commemorate the pleasant years spent by Finn settlement residents as a result of last year's homecoming Finn picnic. It was comprised of Verna Embertson, Eleanor Nemisto, and Gert S. Lampla. At the dedication in June of 1972, Rick Lampla was master of ceremonies, recalling, quote, the rows upon rows of potatoes, rutabaggies, and beans, and how the people showed a vital concern and affection for each other. The principal speaker was the state representative, Ernest Corpola. He recounted, quote, the hardships of all various nationality groups, such as the language barrier, employment, and providing the necessities of life for family. He likened the fears and misunderstandings between nationalities of the early part of this century to the fears and under misunderstandings which are found today between races and minority groups. Fears and misunderstandings which must be overcome if we are to survive as a democratic society. Kitos, which is, thank you.